we present the news quiz with your host, Miles Jupp. <laughs> Welcome to the News Quiz. We start with a cutting from the Town and Country News, read by Neil Sleet. The design team behind the newly refurbished toilets on Cromer Pier have been recognised at the Lou of the Year Awards for the third year on the trot. <laughs> Our thanks to Mel Harris for sending in that little diversion. Uh, now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first, on my right, Jeremy Hardy and Samira Ahmed. And opposite them, on my left, Andrew Maxwell and Susan Kalman. <laughs> Jeremy, who should learn what to stay where? Ah, uh, well, now, this is David Cameron and his lessons for Muslim women. David Cameron managed to do two things. He, he did a, a nod to the liberal wing of his party, which is starting to embrace the idea of women's suffrage, but also... <laughs> managed to stoke the fires of fear and loathing about aliens in our midst. Because forgetting that he's already slashed the funding for English lessons in this country, he's found 20 million for English lessons in this country, but specifically for Muslim women. Now, you see, the tr what he's done is he's drawn a connection between Muslim women not speaking English properly and extremism. Because what it is... Normally, when you hear Muslim women speaking Muslimish, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like just like mumbo jumbo, like people abroad do. And you think, well, that's just harmless gobbledygook, but not so. <laughs> not so in the case of the Muslimic people, because what it is, <laughs> what she's actually saying is, well, what I think is, I, don't, I can't make head nor tail of British culture because I don't speak the language. I've tried Bake Off, means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So straight away I tune into jihadi gold and I'm very happy there. Because <laughs> that's what's happening. Because people who speak English don't have extreme views. We say sensible things in English that Muslimic people don't understand. Like, I think terrorism's a bloody bad show and ISIS would jolly well buzz off. <laughs> and they don't get that. We say sensible, reasonable things like, let's create a power vacuum in an unstable region. Why not drop more bombs? What could go wrong? You know. So this is what he's got to do. He's got to teach them lot to talk proper like we do. <laughs> Jeremy's right. The, the idea that uh, speaking English means that you don't have extremist views is it's incorrect. And what worries me always about these stories about speaking English is what the definition of speaking English is. I, I have occasionally had people <laughs> tweeting me suggesting I don't speak English. <laughs> But it'd be quite good for, for the publishing industry because there'll be a whole new set of, like, you know, the Ladybird reading books to help Muslim women learn to read. So, you know, kind of Peter and Jane, don't go to Syria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely all about speaking English. Me and Jeremy know that. We've been to Belfast. There's a lot of gays there, you know what I mean? I wanted to blow the shit out of the Brits, but then I learned to read. <laughs> Is the link, I have to say, mm. you know, a lot of people are saying that recognising there's a huge issue, the issue with domestic violence, which has been linked to things mm -hmm. like the men who were abusing girls in Rotherham often had wives who didn't speak English at home and the culture of domestic violence, which affected all the women that they abused. But it's just the linking of what should be empowering to terrorism mm -hmm. that yes. people find so offensive. Yes. Who accused Cameron of dog whistle politics? Sayyid uh, Tim Farron. Anyone Ooh. know who he is? <laughs> Lib Dem leader? Anyone know who they are? <laughs> is it just about women who don't, because you don't hear them speak, then the assumption is, you know, they don't speak English and therefore they might be involved in terrorism? Because, like, when was the last time you heard Kate Moss say anything? Oh, yeah, yeah she's, she has been radicalised. <coughs> oh, she is. <laughs> also, has anyone, can anyone remember hearing Samantha Cameron speak? She's no. got a tattoo, you know. <laughs> She's quite the flighty type. <laughs> She's got a tattoo on her ankle. I Some, say. Sometimes. She's like a Diddy Coy girl from the village. <laughs> Good Lord. You imagine a I, tattoo on your ankle, you little scamp. <laughs> you see, there were words used by Andrew there that I don't understand. <laughs> 
Introspectively, this is David Cameron's plan to help Muslim women learn English. Apparently, there are 38,000 Muslim women who speak no English and 190,000 who can only take part in the most basic of conversations, allowing them to participate fully should the need arise in the one show. <laughs> If the women cannot demonstrate a grasp of basic English phrases, such as this is a willful and manifest breach of the European Convention on Human Rights, they will be deported. <laughs> Presumably it's all moot anyway, since if David Cameron's plans come to fruition, by 2020 we'll all have stopped learning English and started speaking Mandarin, if only to be able to plead with our brutal overlords to stop the beating. <laughs> <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Uh, Samira, which new work by Beckett has left critics unimpressed? Oh, well, this Margaret Beckett has written a big report into how and why Labour lost the uh, general election and kind of came up with a whole list of things, you know, to do with kind of hostile media and how they didn't have a strong narrative and the Tories kept bringing out that letter about there being no money left. But, of course, everyone just wants to talk about how much they spent on that stone... The ed, yeah. What's it called? The Edstone? The Edstone. Ed ed so yeah. they spent £8,000 kind of carving this giant limestone rock with his pledges that they were going to then install in a garden. And then they pretended that they didn't know what had happened to it, but they obviously hid it in a garage in South <laughs> London for a while. But the other big thing... Do you know how much Labour spent on that pink lady van? How much? To get it painted pink? £4,742 to refit a van Whoa. for that woman-to-woman -woman thing. Wow. Uh, Part of the cost The garage saw them coming. <laughs> <laughs> Look, but also, you, that's, that's not just the garage. You've yeah, got to pay the DVLA. If you, you change the colour of your car or van, mm -hmm. you have to pay a certain amount of money to the DVLA to, for it to be re-registered as a different colour. I discovered that I buy a lot of stolen vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> Did they exonerate Ed Miliband in the Beckett inquiry? Oh, completely. So it's like, you know... It wasn't his fault. No, I, Ed wasn't. Miliband I definitely lost the election. But was it not more <laughs> the blame was laid at uh, Gordon Brown and, and not reassuring the... Pub. Well, there was lots of reasons, but one of them was the economy. Yeah, the association okay. with the economic crisis of yes, the last Labour But they didn't government. fight it because the Tories kept saying it's all their fault and Labour didn't have a strategy to actually challenge that. I don't think in the Beckett report them saying that the SNP was the reason that Labour failed is correct. <laughs> And that's also to suggest the SNP didn't win positive votes, which is incorrect. The fact that everyone in Scotland voted SNP because Labour were rubbish is wrong. They voted SNP because they thought they were a better party. And the disappointing thing about the Beckett report for me was that they didn't say, actually, the SNP were seen as the anti-austerity party and Nicola Sturgeon was impressive in the debates and actually they quite like her. Not that Labour was rubbish, actually they were better. And until Labour kind of realised that sometimes... People think other people are better. <laughs> They're not going to win anything. But the other thing was they spent £500 on chicken suits. And I was trying to work out how many chicken suits. Or was that one chicken suit on HP? Did you say they spent £500 a day on chicken suits? They spent £577.58 pence in total on chicken suits. Chicken. The chicken it was to appeal was... to the rural vote, the yeah. Tory rural vote. Weren't, no. weren't they following someone around? They it was then... follow... it was, wasn't it to do with Cameron the, the, the wouldn't take part Cameron in the debate? Cameron wouldn't take yeah, part yeah. in the debate, so it was chicken. So they hired but... someone to follow him round in a chicken suit. It does seem a lot to spend on chicken suits, but if you want to re-win the trust of the electorate that you're good with the economy, that's what you need to spend the money on. You've got to show them, we know what's happening, here's all our chicken suits. <laughs> How much did the Tories spend on human suits to go over their lizard bodies? <laughs> if I may, I think there was a much bigger story this week to do with the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't have a name for his cat. <laughs> he calls his cat El Gato, which is just Spanish for the cat. cat. No. <laughs> Because um, the names of cats are important. Jeremy Corbyn says that cats don't respond to names, they respond to voices. That is incorrect. So until that man names that cat, I'm on the fence about him. I am on the fence I about just, him. I, I'm confused by Jeremy Corbyn. On one side, I think he's the sort of guy that I'd be into. You know what I mean? I like dancing around naked on mushrooms in the summer months. <laughs> But when, it, when he's on the news, sometimes I just look at him and I just think, I just can't help but feel there's somewhere there's an allotment being neglected. <laughs> this week, Jeremy Corbyn was talking about his solution to Trident was they would keep the submarines, but they wouldn't have the nuclear warheads, which is like going, you can have your vibrator, but you can't put batteries in it. <laughs> like, either one or it other. It would still work, Andrew. <laughs> 
Decidedly, this is Margaret Beckett's report into why Labour lost the last general election. The review blames Labour's defeat on the Conservatives, the Lib Dems, the Scottish Nationalists and the media. In other words, bigger boys done it. <laughs> Clearly, both the left and the right of the Labour Party are going to interpret this report to suit their own purposes, which appear to be tearing each other to pieces until the entire party resembles a post-apocalyptic battlefield with no survivors apart from a crying man holding a traumatised Spanish cat and weeping, all I wanted was an open and honest debate. <laughs> Also, in an interview with The Independent on Sunday, Jeremy Corbyn revealed that he has a black and white cat, presumably to show solidarity with postal workers. <laughs> Two points to Samira. Andrew, who probably approved a poisoned chalice? I don't want to say. <laughs> uh, this would be none other than my friend, your friend, Vladimir Putin. The What's autocratic, he? half-naked, ox-riding... Poisoner <laughs> of St. Petersburg. Yeah, apparently that's what they reckon. They reckon that he ordered the hit on Litvinenko with the Polonium 210 here in London. And uh, I don't think it's true, Vladimir. <laughs> I just want to say that. It's extraordinary. Like, this is sort of a lot of stuff. I mean, he has been a terrible human being forever. And I think the two things that have kind of made people just generally aware in the general public of what a terrible human... I mean, he levelled Grozny like 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago. I mean, he's a terrible, terrible man. The Litvinenko Goodbye, thing... Andrew. <laughs> the Litvinenko thing, and also him bringing out new anti-gay laws. And you think, what? Now? Well, the rest of the world is waking up to, you know, human equality. You're bringing in new anti-gay laws. I mean, it just apart from the madness and the mean-spiritedness and this deep cynicism of that, it's just the idea that Vladimir Putin would have been sat around his government committee or whatever the hell he has, and after he passed the anti-gay laws, he would have gone, well done, brothers, congratulations. We have finally faced down the scourge of the homosexual. Das Vidanya! Come, brothers! Let us celebrate at the ballet. <laughs> Let's watch these half-naked, ripped, bulgy, cocked men dance on their... <laughs> dance on their tippy toes for our rampantly heterosexual <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> He's an awful man. <laughs> But, I mean, it, you know, there is a suggestion that he was, you know, this was a character, Litvinenko, who may have had a number of enemies. Uh, the Russian state, the Russian mafia, as it's also known. Um, <laughs> or possibly rogue elements within MI6. So, that, you know, he, he did have a number of people that might have but, had an interest in it. But the it. difficulty, in it, are, you know, they've said it's, it's probably him that done it. Well, the problem name. is, the problem Say is, it. is uh, Putin... Thank you. If I'm getting I killed, don't... so are you. No, I... I'm not the only one who's dying because I got that question. <laughs> the difficulty is what happens now. So today's in May, I said it's probably quite bad, and they're freezing the assets of the two people they believe were involved. But there's not an awful lot more that can happen. And so we're left with the reality that Putin probably ordered the assassination of someone in the UK... And what are we going to do about it? And, and it is a genuine issue. They've frozen the, the bank accounts. That doesn't mean anything, does it? But, you know, you've got to remember, I covered this story when it originally happened, and his widow has had to fight so hard to get a public inquiry. Mm. And now we're in a situation still where you kind of don't want to offend the Russians because there's more important things than the fact that they've murdered someone, they contaminated 200 different sites mm. around London with this highly radioactive material, and this man died a terrible death. But, you know, we don't offend the Russians by doing anything like sanctions or anything that would actually make a difference. Don't we get our natural gas from Russia? Isn't it yeah. nice yeah. to be warm in the winter? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the interests of balance, I mean, I do think we're being a bit anti-Putin here. Would, um, <laughs> would anyone like to speak in favour of the Russian president? Well, he has stabilised the Caucasus. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and that's not an easy task. I mean, there are some volatile people. The only thing I can say in favour of Putin is that he's one of the only men that wears a high-waisted trouser well. <laughs> Survived the collapse of, of the Soviet Empire and, and came up smiling. I mean, he's, he was KGB. He's gone from sort of Bond villain to sort of, you know, lovable international sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> with, you know, with, without batting an eyelid. And you, every, pretty much every member of his government is also a former KGB agent. We could nationalise everything that the oligarchs own. All those huge luxury flat blocks, we could turn them to social housing. We could. <laughs>
<laughs> Who's going to make that call? <laughs> Sabbath Council. <laughs> Uh, yes, does anyone know who the inquiry was led by? A lord. Yeah. A judge? Judge. It was, uh, yeah, Sir Robert Owen. Yeah. Oh, he's my yeah. favourite. He's yeah. up there, isn't he? <laughs> and he said there was lots of secret stuff, which is why the Russians are saying, well, how can we believe your inquiry? Because there's lots of secret stuff. Yeah, they stuff. did that thing that they do, which is in court, most of the evidence wasn't heard in public because it's so secret about the national security that no one... And that's one of the things the Russians are saying, is that they don't know what evidence was led because no one can hear what evidence was led because it's so secret, no one knows. So they could have just stood in court and gone, oh, did you see loose women yesterday? It was amazing. <laughs> but no one knows. I don't think that's what they did. But... It's because it, he was MI6. I mean, that isn't an accusation. He was MI6. And they couldn't reveal vital secrets about MI6, like the fact that MI6 haven't got a bloody clue what is going on anywhere in the world. So if that were to become public knowledge, we, we wouldn't be able to watch spooks anymore. <laughs> There's a couple of people on the panel uh, playing quite a dangerous game this evening with various... Uh... No sandwiches after the show, thank you, tonight. <laughs> We're fine, honestly. <laughs> I'd like to say I highly respect the work that MI6 does, and I'm sure they're listening. They probably listen to everything I say. Don't they? they yeah, yeah. Did you I ever... mean, when you do things on the radio, they're probably listening now. Yeah, it's it's, like, it's, like, it's not that sinister. Say? Do you know what I mean? My oldest niece who lives in Gloucestershire and is married to a man who works at GCHQ which gives rise to a certain amount of merriment at family gatherings. So I'll say, oh, Tim, I haven't been keeping up with my emails. What's been going on in my world? <laughs> And he was just very calm. He said, yes, it's very funny. I think, yeah, but he didn't deny it. He didn't deny it. <laughs> Chillingly, an investigation led by High Court Judge Sir Robert Owen has concluded that the murder... He sadly died earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> has, uh, has concluded that the murder of British citizen Alexander Litvinenko in 2006 was probably approved by Russian leader Vladimir Putin. Sir Robert had apparently begun typing the word definitely when a waiter suddenly appeared at his elbow with a pot of green crackling tea. <laughs> As if from nowhere. Or Russia. <laughs> probably Russia. Uh, two points to Andrew. Susan, who won't be sugaring the pills? This is the story about the sugar tax, which has been rumbling on for some time, which has progressed this week with the chief executive of NHS England saying they're going to actually do something about it. So it's not the government, it's the NHS. And they're going to charge higher prices for sugary foods and drinks in hospitals and use the profits to help the health of their own employees. So if you go to a vending machine in a hospital, it'll cost more. I, I avoid vending machines at all times because, I don't know if you know, but statistically you're more likely to be killed by a vending machine than a shark. So I tend to avoid... <laughs> uh, from, it's from shaking... It's not the, the vending machine doesn't attack you. It's from people who can't get their stuff out and then they shake and are crushed by, by vending machines. My, my arm is actually small enough to reach inside the vending machine. The trouble is we're hardwired by evolution to love all these things because they're all things that are not easy to come by if you're a hunter-gathering society, gathering fruit and nuts and trying to make a kind of primitive Dundee cake, which is very hard to bake on an open fire, um, as Mary Berry will testify from her days in the SAS. But... <laughs> The thing about sugar is that, that if you go to a hospital vending machine, most of the people using it are the staff, because they're a junior doctors who've had no sleep, who are living on, on Red Bull and chocolate. God, yeah. And if you start, you know, that's hitting their income as well. And the thing about sugar as well is it's an emotional thing. Sugar is, is basically, it, it's a highly addictive drug, which is why perverts and grandparents use it to manipulate children. <laughs> It's, it's just oh. the food industry, full stop. It's just when you've got kids just dealing with it, you know? They put cartoons on tins of everything. I was with my son, who he was about six at the time, we were in a supermarket, and he loves SpongeBob. You know those baked beans with weird little sausages in them? I love them. Yeah, well, there's them. Because <laughs> yeah. I feel like a giant when I eat them. <laughs> well, you've, got, you've got the standard ones, and then you've got ones with SpongeBob on them, right? And my son, he's like, can we get the SpongeBob ones, can we please? And I had to go, listen, let me explain the food industry to your son, yeah? <laughs> so they make the beans with the sausages, and then sometimes, when they're making it, some of it falls on the floor, goes into dirty corners, and they scoop it up, and then they put it into another tin, and they put SpongeBob on the outside, <laughs> and they sell it to you kids, and they think you kids are stupid. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he just said, does SpongeBob know? <laughs> 
A lot of the branded stuff is more expensive, though, isn't it? Needlessly. I mean, the bride's head revisited venison. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I once did a gig for the biscuit industry, and these were like the top, like the big wigs the, from the biscuit game. Is that when you, how, how your agent sold it? Andrew, it's the biscuit guys. I mean, it's, seriously, it's the big guys. It's not... <laughs> but which one? Was it like Pete Freen or Fox? It was Burton's Biscuits. Really? Yes. Now you're talking the Illuminati. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Vic High, <laughs> Illuminati of Vic High. And they were actually a really nice uh, group of people. And On the, the surface. Oh, of course. But underneath, they're dry, crumbly people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, all went, it all seemed to go fine. And then at the end, I went, listen, you'll be very nice. Can I ask you a question? And they were like, yeah. And I went, it's about biscuits. They're like, knock yourself out. And this is as far as I got before the whole crap house went up in flames. I just went... Wagon wheels. And they were like, they're the same size as they always were! <laughs> I was like, needless to say, I was slightly taken aback. And I was like, but remember it. And they were like, your hands were smaller! <laughs> Everybody's got a breaking point. Yeah. <laughs> Grandiosely, this is the NHS plan to increase prices of sugary food and drink in hospitals by 20% in order to combat obesity and add to the atmosphere of sunny happiness and sheer joie de vivre that is always a feature of the British hospital. <laughs> to be honest, if the prices are going up, I might stop going in. Nothing I enjoy more than heading down to A&E for the afternoon to relax with a cup of solid sugar and enjoy a spot of what I like to call hospital cafe culture. <laughs> Uh, two points to Susan. And at the end of round one, the scores are Jeremy and Samira have four, and so too do Andrew and Susan. <laughs> we start round two with an announcement from the East Anglian Daily Times. Would-be apprentices at Sizewell B are invited to come to an information event on Saturday. Roger Barge, Apprentice Training Coordinator, said apprentices at the nuclear power station enjoy great training and a glowing future. <laughs> Our thanks to Clive Merrison for directing us towards that bit of inexcusable double meaning. Jeremy, why is our welcome for a political apprentice up for debate? Oh, OK. So, um, your man Donald Trump, who was the role model for Lord Sugar, um, in many ways, he made a speech, as he you know, periodically says, just spiteful and, and distorted things. And uh, he made a speech saying that Muslims should not be allowed into America. And so a petition started online. And you, normally when you sign a petition 20 or 30 times a day online, you think, well, no one's going to pay any heed to this. But if you get above a certain number, it has to be debated in Parliament. So rather than have a whole sort of parliamentary session with both houses, they thought they would do a little room with about 100 in, and they have debated this for hours as to whether or not he should be banned from coming to Britain on account of his loathsome, hate-filled ideas. But speaker after speaker got up and said, I would like to welcome him to my constituency so that he could see what a lovely vibrant, happy and harmonious multiracial society we are. I thought, bless, but it really doesn't work like that. You don't change people. That's like thinking that you could change Hitler by showing him a Marx Brothers film. I think you're wrong. I think it could work really well. You know, yeah, interesting views of multiculturalism, but you just imagine that news conference where he meets Prince Philip. <laughs> I think you bring him here, you take him to one of our little vibrant ethnic cafes and let him enjoy sushi with a Russian oligarch. <laughs> the whole thing about Trump just went next level joyous uh, this week with the return of Sarah Palin. Now, I find sometimes life a, a dull cesspool which never has any kind of brightness in it. And then I switched on my television to see Sarah Palin endorsing Donald Trump in one of the greatest political speeches I have ever seen. Um, if you haven't seen it, she shimmies on stage. She's got a kind of a, a shimmy jacket uh, with little pearls on it, made out of the tears of democracy, and she's shimmying <laughs> on stage. It's truly extraordinary to watch. She's the only person to endorse a presidential candidate. And what I love about America is she failed. She did not get elected vice president. 
And any political advisor would say, do not be associated with failure. That is the wrong thing to do. Not for Donald Trump. <laughs> and I, I actually think it's probably a pitch for the VP ticket. I, I genuinely think she's possibly trying to pitch to be Trump's VP. And the way things are going, Trump is leading the Republican race. <laughs> and it could be Trump and Palin running for president and vice president. Hillary Clinton just needs to sit back right now. <laughs> and she'll win just by not being as insane as Donald Trump. Just, he's, oh, he's just on all the time. I'm so bored of Donald Trump. Not I, as you're I, bored I, as you're going to be in five years' time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not only him. Like, the second second in the race, Ted Cruz is just as far right. But he's just in the slipstream being relatively normal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Didn't you like, though, that all the insults they used on him in Parliament, he couldn't understand, and they thought they were talking like Muslim. In, like, calling him a wazak, that sounds a bit... Yeah. Middle Eastern, doesn't it? And you have to explain it. Like, was the it's a bit like, you know, like a pillock or a wally or a plonker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's hard to know. I mean, he's absurd... But is he dangerous? It's that sort of thing. A lot of people in the 30s felt the exact same about little Mr. Hitler. Yep. This guy is ridiculous. <laughs> he won't, like, the thing is, he doesn't have what Bush 2 had. Bush 2 had the Pentecostal rural Protestant vote. He had that block. Trump d doesn't know one end of the Bible from the other. He can't even pretend to be a Pentecostal. So he doesn't have that vote. And his vote base are extreme. If you ever looked at a Trump rally, it's like being menaced by an old folks home. <laughs> Sarah Palin, people do talk about if she, not just VP, but if she'd be Secretary of State, she actually doesn't know the difference between North and South Korea. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. She needs Korea's advice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got something else that she said. What? If God had not intended us to eat animals, how come he made them out of meat? <laughs> <laughs> She's right about a lot of things. She's right about a Whereas lot of Whereas humans things. are made from salad. <laughs> Weird that there are only two well-known people in the world called Palin, and one is an English national treasure and quite the nicest man in the world. <laughs> but his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Absorbingly, this was the debate yes. at Westminster this week about whether Donald Trump should be banned from entering the UK. They debated for three hours and then didn't have a vote. So it was really just a lot of empty chat that had no effect on the world whatsoever. Although, saying those words, I realised that one probably shouldn't throw stones while residing in this, the glassiest of houses. <laughs> Also this week, Sarah Palin endorsed Donald Trump for president, saying that it's great that he isn't a politician but comes from the private sector. And she's right. It's, it's great that Donald has the essential real-world experience of living in a tower made of gold, not to mention his Martin Luther King-like struggle to build a golf course in Scotland. <laughs> Two points to Jeremy. Samira, which red carpet is looking too white? Well, this is the huge row of the Oscars. So last year, not a single black actor was nominated in any of the acting awards. That was 20 nominations and not one of them. And these included people like David Oyelowo, who had an amazing performance as Martin Luther King and Selma. And even at the time, people joked about, oh, this is a celebration of, you know, the best and brightest, whitest of Hollywood. But this year it's happened again. So you've had another 20 nominations. And more than that, every single nomination in almost every major category has not gone to any of these films, which are big films, like Creed, Straight Outta Compton, like Concussion, which people said have had amazing performances and amazing directors. So people are starting to boycott. And it's interesting because apparently Variety magazine was running features as far back as the 1950s about the lack of roles for black actors, the lack of representation. It's been going on for so long. And yet here we are in a situation where 40 chances to nominate talent and not one of them, it turns out, is, is black. So it's, it's a nasty row and they're trying to diffuse it, but it's not going to be easy. But I think people do have stereotypical ideas of what roles black people should do. I mean, even when, even when it was mooted that Idris Elba, and he made a very moving speech this week, but it was mainly about Sky Box sets. But um, <laughs> he, um, he, he, it was mooted that he might play James Bond. And people said, well, that's ridiculous. How could you have James Bond being played by a black man? You think, given that James Bond never ages and changes heads every few years. <laughs> Would it really make any difference if one of them wasn't white? Judy, someone said this to me about Frozen, when I pointed out that Frozen was completely 
white. And they said, yeah, but it wouldn't be realistic if it had any black people in it. And I thought, they feel the cold, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> but they there's trolls and magic. She has ice-throwing powers and snowmen that come alive. And you're worried about, like, the realism of the ethnicity of those involved. I, what troubles me is, why do we give awards for actors for not being rubbish in things? Surely, if you're an actor and you're in something, you're supposed to be good at acting. But everyone goes, oh, my God, that was amazing! I mean, you see, he did, he did a happy face for happy, he did a sad <laughs> face for sad. He pointed the right way. They're not really surviving being buried alive. They're not really spies or being shot. They're just acting in things, and yet you're giving them awards as though they were actually doing the thing they're pretending no, but you to know, do. No, but you see, then, then there's Sylvester Stallone, and he's back as Rocky and Creed, and, you know, he is my melancholy poet of yes. man. <laughs> He's lovely. Yeah, but are you saying that Nigel Havers wouldn't be equally as good in that? <laughs> <laughs> Gushingly, several Hollywood actors and directors have called for a boycott of the Oscars, as for the second year in a row, the nominees in the main categories are all white. Hollywood is trying to embrace diversity. In fact, it has a long history of allowing disabled actors to watch films in which other able-bodied actors pretend to have disabilities and then win Oscars. <laughs> I've never been nominated myself, but as a white, privately educated man, I have no-one to blame other than myself and a society that is simply not prepared to let people like me flourish. <laughs> also this week, the Luther actor Idris Elba addressed a cross-party group of MPs in the House of Commons on the importance of encouraging diversity in the British media industry. Elba told the audience of MPs that he had to move from the UK to the US to get the sort of film and TV roles that would allow him to be ignored by the Academy of Motion Pictures. <laughs> He also made the sound point that television does not properly reflect British society, unlike radio, which has accurately depicted the lives of everyday farming folk for a scarcely conceivable 65 years. <laughs> Two points to Samira. Andrew, have a listen to this. Andrew, who, if they were caught, might have to serve time? <laughs> Who, if they were caught, oh. C O U R T, which is gotcha, the tennis gotcha. spelling. Snooker, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over it. Yeah, apparently, it turns out Vladimir Putin <laughs> has been rigging our beloved strawberry scuffing season that is Wimbledon. Ooh. I know. So easy to make up conspiracy theories. <laughs> I know, it's apparently, it's, um, yes, rumours that Wimbledon, tennis in general, my friends, is corrupt. <laughs> I know. That's the most excited they've been all evening. <laughs> if you went into international politics, imagine the possibility Wimbledon might be fixed in area. Oh, my goodness. What next? A third boat in the boat race? <laughs> What was that mystery boat on the grassy knoll? <laughs> apparently, it's, yeah, it's, apparently it's, uh, tennis is a hotbed of it. It's, it. It turns out tennis is just tightly shorted mixed doubles version of cycling or <laughs> athletics or any other sport. Because it turns out sport, slightly corrupt because people gamble on it, unlike acting. <laughs> Nobody gambles on the acting. I think it's, Clive Owen takes it, a risk every time he walks on screen, to be honest. <laughs> you think Tim Henman will be coming forward saying, yes, I was bribed, actually, yes, I threw all those games, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I made a fortune. They actually said there was a few Grand Slam winners, potentially, mm. um, had been bribed. Well, who's through... been forced to deny specific allegations against him this week? Djokovic, wasn't Indeed, it? Indeed, yeah. yeah. When there's betting involved... There will be people who try to bribe people to throw matches. You can't say just because everyone's very polite at Wimbledon that there's not corruption. Yeah, it's not like there's not corruption. How much do they charge for those unripe strawberries? Like five quid for three. <laughs> They're all at it, basically. You know, tennis, corrupt, football. I don't think it's particularly easy to corrupt a football game, except for a goalie or the referee. Yeah. But the rest of it's a bit too random. Rugby, easily. I mean, nobody knows all the rules anyway. <laughs> It's impossible. I mean, once the ball's in there, who knows what's happening? <laughs> All we know is there's a lot of inappropriate touching and screaming. <laughs> is that illegal, though? We don't know. And as for corruption in cricket, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> who cares? Every, like, six months I turn on the news, there's been another corruption scandal in cricket. Who cares? Uh, which of the seven days did it happen on? <laughs>
Well, you cannot be seriously. These are the allegations made by a South American ex-player that match-fixing by gambling syndicates is rife in the sport of tennis. This was a joint investigation by the BBC and BuzzFeed, which also uncovered a list of Britain's cutest corrupt cats. <laughs> This whole thing has cast the biggest shadow over Wimbledon since a player once turned up in shorts that were frankly, and I shudder to even use the words, (laughs) off-white. I'm shocked that the outcome of matches could have been fixed in advance, though. It would be a real blow to think that my relentless, heartfelt cries of come on, Tim, had had no effect on the result whatsoever (laughs) and that I'd merely been shouting into the void as my grave crept ever closer. (laughs) Thankfully, while tennis may be corrupt, the scoring system on the news quiz remains sacrosanct. So, uh, two points to Andrew. Susan, have a listen to this. Richard Morris, and it was a BBC radio comedy production. (laughs) 